to UC Berkeley undergrad, and I was a grad counselor in an undergrad dormitory working my way through law school, and they put the Cal Berkeley freshman football team into the dorm. And one of the students was the quarterback, Steve Bartkowski. And I had traveled the world after law school and when I got back and was thinking about jobs, um, Bartkowski ended up being the first player selected overall in the 1975 NFL draft. And, um, and he asked me to represent them, him. And um, so there I was just in my first legal case, never having practiced before, but I had the first pick in the draft who was picked by the Atlanta Falcons. And we got the largest rookie contract in NFL history. And um, I didn't realize how athletes were the movie stars, how they were the celebrities, but I experienced it in Atlanta because when we got to the airport, there were lights like for a movie premiere in the sky when Bartkowski and I arrived and a crowd pressed up against a police line. And they said, we're gonna interrupt the late news to bring you a special news bulletin. And, and so my dad had raised me with two core values. One was treasure relationships, especially family. And the second was to try to make a meaningful difference in the world and help people who couldn't help themselves. And I saw that if the athletes would go back to the high school community they were from and set up a scholarship fund or uh, work with the church or boys and girls club, they could make a difference off the field. And if they did the same thing at the college level, um, so, Troy Aikman went back to UCLA and set up a scholarship fund. Um, and then as a pro level, I challenged each of them to find some cause in the world they'd like to tackle. And then set up a charitable foundation with the leading business figures, political figures, and um, community leaders to help execute a program to help people. So work done, a former running back for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers and Atlanta Falcons just put the 200th single uh, a woman and her family in the first home they'll ever own by making the down payment. So it's athletes changing lives. So can you talk to a little bit, because you've done, uh, and I, correct me if I'm wrong on these figures, you've helped coordinate $750 million in donations to charities. What is that feeling like to be a world changer? You have, you have the quote, and I'll quote you on this, where you say, light candles, then uh, light more candles than curse the darkness and the glow will fill the world. Can you kind of uh, elaborate a little bit on that? So. My father, when I was growing up, used to look at me and he'd say, if you're looking for someone to fix a problem or to make a difference, as small as picking up a piece of trash and as big as fighting racism or pushing back climate change, he'd say your tendency will be to wait for other people 
they, them, the amorphous they, older people, political figures, to take action. And he would say, you could wait forever. He'd say, the they is you, son. You are the they. So I was always filled with a sense that any of the big problems in the world, whether it was, um, whether it was uh, sex trafficking or, or bullying or uh, the environment or racism or any of these problems, that the person who had to take care of it was me and other people with the same feelings. So uh, it's a sense of personal responsibility that we've been so lucky to be blessed, especially in this country with a democracy and a high standard of uh, living, that, that I can feel the pain of other people. So um, one time Madeleine Albright, who was Secretary of State, and myself were concerned with the issue of landmines, which were in Angola, Cambodia and Mozambique. And so they're wars. And then when they're over, they leave these mines and people have their limbs broken off and they can't farm. And so we put together a program called Adopt a Minefield, where you could do the heavy work of taking these landmines out. Um, but again, you could wait forever. Everyone on this call has the ability to make a difference in the world. That's great advice. Do you mind if we jump in, into some more student questions we, uh, before we let you go? We'll keep you a few more minutes. No, oh, that's fine. Sure. All right. We have Mev. She's in Italy. She had a pretty good question. Go ahead and ask Mev. Hello. Hi. Nice to meet you. Uh, I would like to know, uh, how do you drive and maintain the high level of your clients? I mean, it must be difficult to represent them with their different via viewers and needs. So how do you do it? Could you repeat the question? I mean, she uh, wanted to know how do you represent so many different clients with so many differing personalities? What is that? What is that like? So I think the key skill in life is listening. Um, and it's drawing out another human being so that you cut below the surface to understand what it is that really fulfills or motivates them. How do they feel about short-term money or long-term security or family considerations, or spiritual considerations or geographical location or the ability to be a starter or endorsements or all these different uh, priorities fit into people's lives. <clears throat> well, men don't tend to share as easily. I'm sure the women on this call or the young ladies on this call will as, men, as women do. So you have to work harder to draw out and get beyond the surface response someone will give you. So by the end of that, I have the ability with each client to understand their deepest anxieties and fears and their greatest hopes and dreams. So if I've been able to get into their, um, uh, into their heart and mind, can you see the world the way the other person can see it? So the key to handling so many differing personalities, because I've done football, baseball, basketball, boxing, soccer, um, hockey, um, is to individually draw them out and always try to see the world through the eyes of the other person. And you've negotiated around, uh, it's over $3 billion in contracts, correct? Yes. That that is a lot of zeros. Um, so we have a question from Arnau. Arnau, go ahead. You can unmute and ask your question. Yes, I, I saw that you are to a Tango Bailoas agent, and recently he suffered a conclusion. And I want to know how do you feel as an agent, and if you talk to him after the Bills game when he has the first conclusion. Thanks. Can you repeat the question? 
Yeah, he wanted to know about Tua's injury. And as an agent, I know that you're very active when it comes to CTE and head injuries. Um, how did you approach that as, as an agent? Like when you see one of your players, I know as far back as Troy Aikman that you dealt with that, uh, where you have uh, brain injuries and concussions on your players, like, because there's a whole personal level there. So Arnau kind of wants to know, how did you deal with that? And did you talk to him after the Bills game? So I had a, a crisis of conscience back in the 1980s because I'm representing half the starting quarterbacks in the NFL, and they keep getting hit in the head. And we would go to doctors and ask, how many is too many? What's the magic number? And they didn't have any answers. So I started holding concussion conferences and got neurologists and people to talk about it. And finally, we found the answer that three or more concussions lead to a higher rate of Alzheimer's, Parkinson's disease, chronic traumatic encephalopathy, depression, and uh, premature dementia. So it's a big issue. And um, we now have certain forms of testing whether players should go back into a game or whether he should sit out a week. So I try to stress long-term health with my players and get them to be cautious. I've tried to explore a variety of, of different ways to protect the brain or heal a concussed brain. And um, so it's a, very, it's a difficult discussion because players have accepted since they were young the fact that real men play no matter what their injuries are, that you don't want to be left out of the lineup. And so it's called athletic denial. So they accept levels of pain the rest of us wouldn't. So it's one of the troubling parts of my job to try to get players to be more self-protective because they just accept that injury is part of the game and will do very risky things. We have a, uh, we'll go with a couple more questions. I'm going to let you go. This is Lorraine and uh, Lorraine's in France. Go ahead and unmute and ask your question, friend. Okay, so I would like to ask, so which client was for you the best representative, the one you were the most proud of? Gotcha. Um, well, currently I'm very proud of a, a football player we have named Patrick Mahomes, who's a quarterback for the Kansas City Chiefs. And he came right on in his first year and was MVP of the whole league and then won a Super Bowl. But if you like him on the field, you love him off the field because he has a charitable foundation called 15 and the Mahomes, in which he helps kids that are at risk um, uh, or have diseases or underprivileged. And, and so during COVID, he was buying them school lunches. He um, is tireless that way. Um, my longest lasting client was a quarterback who went to the University of Washington and then um, played in Canada for six years. His name was Warren Moon. And at that point, there weren't many black quarterbacks in the NFL. And so he went and played in another league for six years, but he came back and 12 teams bid on him and he was the highest priced player in the whole league. And when he went into the Hall of Fame, I gave the presenting speech for him. And just to show you what he's done, he set a scholarship fund up at his high school, at his junior college, at the University of Washington, and then something called the Crescent Moon Foundation that sends kids to uh, college on his scholarships. So there have been hundreds of kids who've gone to college on his scholarships. So we've uh, been in each other's lives for about 40 years. So I'd have to put him at the top. One of the things I like about you is that you, like how you had said, uh, hearts and minds, and that you, you truly do care about these people. And it really shows that um, we have our final student question, and this is from Jonah. And Jonah, you should be able to unmute and ask. You had a pretty good question. Okay, thank you. And 
my question was, um, on average, how many clients did you have at one time? So, um, so I had um, 90 football players, NFL football, for the rest of the world, uh, our football, your football is our soccer. Um, but um, I had 90 in, um, in football. I had uh, about 50 in baseball. I had 17 NBA players. Um, and uh, I did Olympic people like uh, Brian Boitano, who uh, uh, won the gold medal for ice skating, or Kerry Strug for gymnastics. I represented the US team in its World Cup um, uh, representation of the US back in 1994. Um, now, obviously, I couldn't do every bit of that myself. So, the key to getting successful in business is once you create a brand and everything today is about brand it's about how many followers you have on twitter or TikTok, and that brand then becomes the ability to do all sorts of interesting uh projects but um but i had to be willing to train younger agents to be known as superstars because when you own a business you can make the argument you you could do everything better than everybody else and it takes too much time to train them but the point is you will do everything yourself so i was able to create a large group of people who could substitute for me with clients still being happy and uh, um, that's the way we did. I did um, 64 first round draft picks in, in football and eight of them were the first pick in the draft and, uh, and uh, about 15 first round picks in baseball. That is a lot of work. <laughs> so I can't. Congratulations on the successful career. And uh, you guys, we have plenty of awesome guest speakers like Mr. Steinberg coming up. So definitely check it out in the chat. But Mr. Steinberg, before we go, as someone who is so accomplished in your career, you're obviously number one in what you do and you have been for a long time. What kind of advice would you give for these kids as they go off into the world and figure out what they want to do? Well, the thing I said about listening skills, um, if you can always try to put yourself in the other person's heart and mind um, um, and think about the situation, not just from what you want, but from their perspective. When it's time to go get uh, a job or an internship, your job is going to be to distinguish yourself from everybody else and find a way to make your skills unique, non-modular uh, or fungible, but unique. And just know you do have the capacity. Uh, the other thing is to look inside yourself and try to figure out what really motivates you. What's important to you? Is it money? Is it, is it making a difference in the world? Is it profile? Is it autonomy, being your own boss? But always be aware of what what you're looking for in the world and what your priorities are. And then know that each of you, the world's just waiting for you, um, but bring a unique vision for how you can make the world or business a better place. Um, you would like to make the world better than, than your predecessors made it. So, uh, think about the contributions you could and, and, and try to help other people when you get the chance. That is wonderful, wonderful advice. And we can't thank you enough for your time. Um, be sure to definitely check out his website and follow him on social. He has a lot of good uplifting material that he posts. And you can go, you can go to Lee L A I G H at Steinberg sports, Steinberg speaks.com. And you can go to steinbergspeaks.com. And uh, when you get a little older, some of you can come work for me. 
<laughs> there we go. There we go. Wow. That's a huge deal. I got some smiles there. So uh, before I let everyone go, I'm going to let everyone unmute to say thank you to Mr. Steinberg for spending his very, very important time with you guys today to give you guys some advice. So thank you so much for your time, sir. We appreciate you. Thank 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 you.